Hello and welcome to today's webcast, Emerging Themes in Mentoring, a Global Perspective. I'd like to thank everyone for joining today and for those of you who have in the past, you will notice that this is the second webcast we're doing on mentoring. Today is all about conducting mentoring programs but talking about it in a global perspective. So we'll be looking at some trends and we have an amazing panel to discuss a few different things that are emerging on the scene as well. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Uh, Professor sorry, David Clutterbuck and also Melissa Richardson from Art of Mentoring. How are you both today? Yeah, well, thanks. Pretty Sarah. good. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. What we're going to do is just take a look at what we're going to cover and as you can see the agenda on the screen. Um, but Melissa, first of all, let's start with your recent research which covers the first topic. Sure. Um, so the first topic we're talking about really is why companies and membership organisations in particular are introducing mentoring. Why now why, and how they're currently designing and implementing mentoring programs. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't a lot of research done, particularly outside the corporate space, but mm -hmm. if you look at what was already published in the literature, we know that for companies that are obviously employers, there's a lot of benefit in, um, in actually putting up a good mentoring program to become an employer of choice. So it actually builds brand reputation. It helps people engage um, in the business or the, or the organisation. It actually helps a lot with retention and, funnily enough, return to work. I think mm. some of your data, David, looks at Very much people so. who yes. left and then if they have a mentor, they're much more mm. likely to return. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and also just building capacity. Um, so we know from the published literature that if people are in a program, they're actually much more likely to have a salary increase um, they're much more likely to maintain connection and loyalty to a, an organisation. What we didn't know was what are some of the kind of micro reasons that maybe um, organisations were embarking on mentoring. And we surveyed just over 100 um, organisations. We found um, quite a lot of them were running mentoring programs, so we asked them what was um, the purpose for them to be, to be running their programs. And these were the sorts of things people were saying. So for, particularly for associations, they were running programs to help students make uh, career choices. In corporates, it was often about helping graduates transition into a chosen profession, mm -hmm. uh, assisting new recruits to assimilate into a company, creating those intergenerational links and transferring knowledge from the baby boomers, because mm -hmm. we know many of us in that baby boomer age group will retire sometime in the next 20 years or so, so how are we going to hand that knowledge over? Another important role for mentoring, and I'll talk a, a little more about that later, is actually providing support and reducing the isolation that comes, particularly for people who are working in uh, remote locations, which can be an issue in, in Australia because it's such a big country. Um, just using mentoring to engage and connect people. Um, another common use of mentoring is helping women and people from ethnic minorities to advance their careers. So I've been involved in a lot of programs for mm -hmm. women, as, as David. Um, Members in an organisation like associations really want an avenue to give back. They're actually often champing at the bit. We know that um, mentoring actually helps develop leadership skills within an industry or a profession uh, and build leadership capacity in a company. So all of these things that I'm putting up, I won't go through the rest, were the, the kinds of things that uh, people were saying, mm. this is why they're running mentoring. So within this, obviously there's some great reasons here and I'm pretty sure we can all relate to them. Mm. When it does come to mentoring, no, because um, I am part of mentoring in my work at the moment and in the yeah. past I've been part of these programs. So the research, is this were these people that had been part of formal mentoring programs or they, were they perhaps more unstructured? It was a bit of both. That, mm. that was another interesting finding in the research actually mm. because some people were running a, what we would call a more formal or a structured program yep. and in that case... You know, they had a beginning, a middle and an end of the mm. program. They had a lot of touch points where the program administrators could check in with the participants. And then there were other organisations that had perhaps just a list of mentors on a website where people could go and self-select. Um, there were some differences. We found that the people who were had more of the formal uh, and the, mm. the structure tended to be a bit happy with the results they were getting from their program, which kind of supports what we believed, mm. wasn't it, David? We Absolutely, kind of yeah. thought that, but it's now nice to have some data. So why is that? that? Why is that, do you think, besides the obvious reasons, David? I think there's a very clear re reason for that, is that people 
there is a clear correlation from the research uh, between the the sense of purpose for the relationship. Mm. Well, why is this supported? Is it was it wanted? Is there somebody who's actually actually behind all this, or mm. there's some real reason for doing this for the organisation and the quality of the conversations that people have? Yeah. Um, and the, the the sense that if it's supported, you can be much more open in the conversations. Mm. So I think that's one of the reasons you just get a better quality relationship. Otherwise, it could just be having a chat, right? With exactly, nothing exactly. really well, tied to it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and sometimes those little check-ins from a program manager, just a reminder. You know, you're, mm. you know, we're three months in. Maybe it's time to talk about these sorts of things mm. with your mentor. People just find that really useful. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so moving on now, um, we're just going to launch a poll because we do want to get your opinion. Um, so when it does um, come to mentoring, we would like you to just um, use your computers to actually um, select the best one that represents you. So we would like you to please select the mentoring program types that you offer within your organisation. Um, so we're just going to launch that poll now. Um, and then we'll actually see the results coming through. So as you're actually completing those, I just want to turn to our panel. So what do we usually see? So um, when you do go into organisations, what's probably the most common one that you see people are running? Um, in corporates, well, it's definitely high potential talent yeah. programs. The emerging leaders and stuff like that. Globally, it's yeah. very, very, it's very diverse. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, and interestingly, we, we, we've seen a movement over the last 20 years away from a very high dominance mm. of graduate programs into a much wider um, range of, of different kinds of programs. And they tend to be focused on what the business needs are at the moment. Yeah. Um, and it could be there's a particular group like first line managers, for example, or, or there's a need for a culture change mm -hmm. in an organisation. So all of those things might, might inform it. But certainly the biggest one globally seems to be, um, or there's two themes globally. One is about entrepreneurs mm -hmm. um, and particular, mm, especially would, small, yeah. business, small businesses, and the other is diversity. So actually yeah. really leveraging and, and using the, the, the range of talents from all sorts of different people in the organisation. Mm. Yeah, and do you find it does, does vary um, when it comes to industry? Yes, yes, but we don't have any real statistics okay. to, 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 to demonstrate that. Well, hopefully this poll will give us some more statistics. Yes, exactly. So um, we actually have some results and we'll actually um, share them with you. Um, but top coming in at 20%, Young Members Mentor Programs. Mm. Um, just beneath that, we have um, on a tie, 16.5%. Uh, we have Student Mentor Programs and then also Diversity Mentor Programs, which really is in line with what you're saying. Um, and then underneath that, we've got the Mentor Program for High Potential Talent. Talent, so around 12% there. Um, and then going under that, the peer mentor program. Um, reverse mentor programming, very, very yeah. small right at the bottom there. Yeah. So some interesting research to come out of that. Maybe you can use that in your next report, yes. David. <laughs> well, we can just show you actually. Um, so we looked at associations, so professional and industry associations separate from corporates. Yep. And you can see here what the associations are doing is targeting different member stages, which makes a lot of sense. You know, they're looking at their student population, looking at graduates, then young members. So they're kind of for following mm. how careers develop over time. If we look at um, the next slide, which is companies, not associations, they're much more likely to have a general program where anyone can participate. So that was the highest. And then the high potential talent program. Okay. Um, so Diversity mentor programs were a bit lower, but that might have just been our particular pool. I think in, in associations they would tend to be lower because the, the mm. diversity programs tend to folk, to be concentrated in the corporates mm. yeah. because they've got more there's, it's, there's bigger pressure on on, on corporates to, mm. uh, to to make that happen. There's one missing off here that we do find in some countries, and that and that is programs which are aimed at the owners of professional body professional right. um, firms. Um, and what, what, what happens there is that you, ha you tend to have mentors who are people who've probably retired mm. um, but been in the same role. They, they've been the chief executive of a, of, of a professional firm and so they mentor the chief executives of, 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 um, who are younger than themselves um, but are still in post. Mm. OK, so we know what people are doing within organisations now. Um, do we know how well organisations are doing with their mentor programs? So we've obviously got the statistics on what they're doing, but how do we even measure that? Is it just a matter of asking people or how does that all work? Well, in this research, we, we actually asked what they were doing and how satisfied were they mm. with the results they were getting. And we compared 
what they were doing with some of the best practice guidelines from standards like ISMP, which is now ISMCP, I think, it's yes. just changed, which is some international standards for mentoring and coaching programs. Um, so we compared what they were doing with those standards and we found that mostly they were doing quite well, but falling down in a few of the key areas that we know really are the success factors for a mentoring program, particularly around training um, of the mentors and the mentees who participate. So not mm -hmm. enough of them were actually doing um, good quality training. Uh, and also not quite enough of following the mentoring pairs along the journey, so not enough checking in, not enough, if mm -hmm. you like, pastoral care. This is really interesting, though. This, um, this is now, you know, we're starting to get some big data, which is really giving us some new insights into what's happening. Came across this company, which is runs a website. that It's called In Her Site. So it's all about women and places that they've worked. And these, um, these women, they've had 90,000 women ranking 17,500 companies. Mm -hmm. It's pretty US-centric, but, you know, I think it's interesting to start there. And they ask women to rate the company that they work at over a number of criteria, one of which was mentorship and sponsorship programs. And they actually found a very high correlation between the um, highly rated mentoring programs with loyalty and satisfaction. So basically the conclusion of this organisation was if your female em employees are unhappy with your mentorship program, they're much more likely to be dissatisfied at work overall, mm. which is a little bit scary, isn't it? So, mm. you know, we actually think there's a lot of programs out there. Um, some of them maybe are not being rated very well. Mm. They, they then start almost a scorecard wow. of companies being ra ranked on their mentorship program. So you'll see there you know, some quite well-recognised names, a, a company like Johnson & Johnson. That's not really surprising that they would have a good program. You know, Ernst & Young. Um, mm. LinkedIn. So it's interesting to see some relatively newer organisations. Yeah. So your HubSpot, HubSpot and people right that have top. emerged, yeah, only recently. So and LinkedIn as well. But I wonder if that's these newer style of organisations are yeah. actually embracing some of these more. You know, David's done work at Facebook, for mm. example, who are embracing more the coaching and mentoring kind of. Approach. Well, I think they're finding what, what, what many organisations, these, these newer organisations, are finding is if if they want to be able to react very fast. Um, somehow you've got to create good connections between people. Mm. And so the learning process is, 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 there, is also, it, it's essential. It's part, it has to be part of their culture, otherwise they can't function. Mm. So we get a lot of informal mentoring happening as well as formal mentoring. Yes. There was, um, just on that as well, and this ties in um, nicely, um, on the news last night, there was um, do you, um, the, C, uh, the chairman of Beyond Blue, which is a mental health organisation, um, and he was actually talking about the fact that mental health and the mental health of your employees should now be, in the future, KPIs for actual CEOs. Mm. So that sort of goes into that informal mentoring. And how do you think that's going to, what do you think that's going to have an impact on in the future, you know, mental health and actually business mentoring. Does that all play a part and can you see a shift happening when people are becoming more aware of this stuff within the workplace? Well, I mean, mentoring uh, as an intervention to improve wellbeing mm. outcomes is one of the trends that I'm seeing certainly here in Australia and I'd be really interested to see how that's playing out in other countries. Mm. Um, yes, I think so. I think I think it's terrific. I yeah. think CEOs should be, mm. you know, they should be measured on their contribution to the well-being of the people in their companies. Don't yep. you, David? Yeah, it's 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 one of those th it's one of those thing phenomena that's happening in some countries and and it hasn't even been thought of in others. Really? Yeah. So in, in in Ireland and parts of Northern Europe, it's yep. it's, it's actually not uncommon. Yep. Um, uh, and also within the, the within the health in industry, there's even something we were talking about earlier, which is uh, where the, the, we have mentoring between patients who've got chronic disease mentoring the doctors. Wow. So the doctors really understand what it's like from the perspective of the patient. Mm. So, there's, there, 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 so there's some interesting yeah. wrinkle, wrinkle, wrinkles around this. I think we will be seeing a, a lot more application towards mental health areas. Mm. We've seen quite a lot of work around people with, um, with Asperger's, for example. Yep. There's lots of programs for, for those. Now, whether you define that as mental health or, mm. or, 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 or not is a debatable question. Yes. Um, but nonetheless, this whole area of the way that people think and, their, and, and the way that they fit into the work, work, mm. workplace and how they're supported to the workplace, mentoring is playing an increasing role there. 
Well, yeah, I think a lot of the, a lot of it does happen now, but they are quite informal. And if you know what we're talking about, mm. how um, beneficial formal programs can be, that's probably where the shift's going to happen. I would think in the next few years, especially mm. within Australia. Mm -hmm. We're also seeing a, a big rise in the in mentors um, um, working alongside therapists. Oh, okay. So. Uh, what's happening there is, is that clearly the mentor cannot be a therapist and can't, can't, can't help somebody yes. work with their, with their, with their, their, their problems. Mm. Uh, um, but, the, but the mentors are also somebody who can help them think about the practical side mm. of what do they do and how do they actually manage their career in the context of yes. a disease like schizophrenia, for example. Mm. Could be a fine line then, couldn't it, between counsellor and mentor? <laughs> yeah, so they have to talk to each other. Yes. Definitely. Um, so just a little bit off there, but just going back to what you were speaking about, Melissa, um, and females and the role that organisations are playing now when it does come to females in the workplace, I'm really interested, um, especially speaking of females, David, because I know you've just written a book about um, females re-entering the workplace and how this all impacts that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, what drove that to happen and how what, it's, what, what is it all about, really? Well, essentially, when somebody comes back, into the workplace, having been away from on maternity leave for mm. maybe a year, in, it varies from country to country, uh, except in the States where it's two weeks or something like that, yeah. which is ridiculous. Um, but if they've been away for a reasonable period of time, um, then things happen inside the organisation mm. and things happen to them as well. But, you know, being a mum changes you. Yeah. Um, and so, so helping people through that very significant transition um, proves to be, be a, a really good investment, mm. um, both in terms of getting them back to their higher level, their, their original level of levels of productivity very quickly, um, but also in, in terms of whether they come back at all. Mm. So there's a much higher, uh, those organisations that have implemented maternity mentoring have found that it has a, had a really big and positive impact. And that impact has been particularly um, high when we're talking about people at more senior levels, mm. because the more senior you are, the more you get things done through influencing people. Mm. But if you've been away, all your influence networks have disappeared. People yes. have learned how to get on without you. So here you are, you're a mum, you're sitting at your desk and you're wondering, what do I do now? Um, and you're still feeling a little bit guilty and worrying about the baby at home yeah. and all those things. So having a mentor, somebody, another mum at the same level, and it is important they're at the same level, um, um, who's been through the whole process, can help you just think through how do I re-establish myself? Mm. Um, and it's, 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 it's proven one, that one a really major benefit mm. for, uh, for, for women to coming back into the workplace. Um, Melissa, have you seen any examples of this in Australia or yeah, is this something look, we want to yes. <laughs> aspire to be? But not so many. I'd like yeah. to see more. Uh, and I think we were talking about it earlier, actually. I mean, this isn't new. Mm. So maternity mentoring and, and, and back to work, supporting women back to work isn't new. But I think it's, it's, it's having a bit of a resurgence, really. Mm. Um, yeah. And I think it's because so many companies have diversity targets now mm. and they need to keep their, their women. Uh, so there's a renewed interest in it. But mm. I would like to see more because I think it's a wonderful, wonderful yeah. way to use mentoring. I also think with so many women going into technology in those sort of areas these days, it just mm. changes so quickly. Yeah. By the time they do get back, it's actually going to be quite daunting to actually see what does change and to have that support network would definitely be an advantage for most women, I would guess. Mm. Um, so there's maternity mentoring. So we did that was the first time I heard of that when we spoke earlier today. Yeah. Um, ethical mentoring is something else that was yeah. briefly mentioned. So can we just touch a little bit of, on that? Basically, this this comes out of the financial crisis. Okay, um, it's always and all the and all, and all the scandals that mm. went with that, and and, and all of the problems about um, large organisations, particularly financial services mm -hmm. organisations, doing unethical things, and, and and basically not people like the boiling the frog in boiling water, mm. not not not, not realising what was going on. Yeah. Um, and so the, the the start of this was the Institute of Chartered Accountants mm -hmm. in England and Wales. Um, uh, and they, they they asked us to look at it, it, at how we could uh, how they could create a program that would create mentors who would basically inside financial services firm uh, financial services firms, but also any kind of, of uh, finance department uh, okay. yeah, uh, in organisation um, who would be able to help people work through ethical dilemmas. Hmm. Uh, and so the training for these people is partly to train them as mentors, yep. but partly to give them some understanding of the psychology of ethicality so they can help people work through a, 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 a clear process um, of thinking about, the, of thinking about the, the issues that they face, mm. sometimes recognising that a dilemma is there. 
And so this is now spread, and there are all sorts of organisations like Diageo and uh, the National Health Service in, in the UK and, and elsewhere. The, the, I, the idea that you can actually have people in the workplace mm. who other people can come to when they, th they either have an ethical dilemma or think they might do. Mm. Um, and so a large part of this role is helping people build ethical resilience so the ability to know that this that, that maybe they need to step back and look at something, mm. and so and so what the ethical mentors have been equipped with is some some very basic tools, of having those conversations that help people look at the, the issue, work out the values around it, um, work out what the conflict of values is and how work how to manage with the, those, um, and then come to conclusions and test those conclusions mm. from an ethical basis. It's almost like a conscience. <laughs> Well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. They, are, they, they become yeah. the corporate conscience. And in fact, yeah. many of them um, also now are become, report back to the, to the, to the board mm. or the top team in the organisation with a particular uh, uh, emphasis on helping the organisation itself become more ethically minded. Mm. Interesting. Has that, has that even begun over here? Not really. No. <laughs> Is there anyone pushing for this change? Or how does just listening over the um, past 20 minutes or so, especially hearing about, you know, what's happening over in all these other countries and then what's happening in Australia, mm. how's the connection between this happening? So obviously you both talk. Um, mm. You know, is there... Um, is this sort of stuff being transferred? Is there a knowledge gap? Or how is this, how are we going mm. to move forward in Australia based on what's yeah. happening overseas? Look, I think each country, the, 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 the issues kind of bubble up and you deal with what's yeah. happening, but there are some themes that are common around the world. Um, you know, we're seeing it in our politics, so why not in our organisations? Mm. Um, I, I, look, I just don't think... I would love if there's any banks out there. We'd love to run some ethical yeah. mentoring because yeah. that's you know probably any, any doctors space. out there. Any yeah. doctors, <laughs> another one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think this notion of um, picking an issue and then training up a, a panel or a group of people that mm. specifically can provide mentorship around those sorts of issues. I think that's the interesting theme, and I think mm. that that is emerging everywhere around the world. Mm. But it, the topic may be different. Maybe it's more around ethics uh, in yeah. Europe. Um, with us, and I'm going to give an example back to the mental health. Mm. And, you know, it's actually happening around mental health here. Yeah, let's go back and talk about because um, we briefly touched on yeah. that the fact that um, mentoring and mental health it can be used as a preventative measure, mm. um, and I think that's really important. Like we said, a lot of organisations investing and seeing how much benefit it can have, um, both financially and also with the people involved. Let's talk a little bit more about that and how that all, how what yeah. you what you've been doing. Well, this just came out of um, what our clients were asking mm. us for. Just an observation really and we went and, and uh, tried to look at you know what's some of the data around this and we know that just in Australia untreated mental health conditions cost us an estimated 10.9 billion dollars per year wow. which is made up of absenteeism presenteeism mm. which is a big problem um, and 146 million in compensation claims so you know, we know that mentoring is a way of engaging people, so surely, you know, tackling that issue around presenteeism, for example. Um, here's, but here's some interesting things that, it hap that are happening. So there's an organisation here called Superfit Mates, which um, actually create, has created a peer support mentoring program that they go into corporates primarily and they, they train up a cadre of mentors in that particular workplace who are trained to recognise and respond to mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly the same concept as your panel of ethical mentors, but mm. in this case applied to mental health. And so I know that's been rolling out in a few um, corporates in Australia. I think that's a terrific idea. We know that for some particular professions where they face, um, you know, really quite alarming depression and anxiety rates, mm. such as we know that, for example, lawyers um, suffer from depression and anxiety, um, but also there are some issues for newly graduated mm. veterinarians who may be uh, working somewhere quite remote because they haven't been able to get a placement close yeah. to where they live. They're, um, all their normal support mechanisms are broken because they've moved away. They've got very few people to talk to. So... You know, the, the mere fact that they've actually got somebody assigned to them as a mm. mentor is almost like a safety net and someone that they can discuss these issues with. So we've started talking with psychologists mm. to try and understand a little more about, um, about how this phenomenon 
actually works and, and why mentoring might contribute. And one of the things that, you know, we were talking about was we know from, uh, from research that mentoring helps to build self-confidence. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that from the published research, but one of the things we track from people on our programs mm. um, for both mentees and mentors, self-confidence, self-efficacy is the single most important or single most reported sort of universal benefit. Mm. Even if people don't say, I'm trying to build self-confidence, they seem to get it anyway, mm. which is really great. Um, and what the psychologists say is, well, we know that if you can raise self-confidence, you're actually equipping people better to cope in a mm. stressful situation. So it's actually a real preventative measure for mental wellbeing mm. and, and wellness. Um, this is just a quote from uh, Dr. Jay Spence. Uh, the, the factor most likely to impact the level of stress a person feels is the amount of support that person perceives that they have. Mm. You know, we'll put them in a well-supported mentoring program with a mentor. So yes. they've got their mentor, they've got some terrific program managers who are also there to help them. Um, you know, it's a kind of no-brainer that this mm. would work. I do feel like it's come a long way as well. We spoke, I think it was even 12 months ago, we yes. did a webcast last yes. on mentoring and the fact now we're bringing psychologists into it and we're talking about mental illness, it just mm. shows how quickly it's moving. Um, and I think, you know, what's some research on the other side of it? So I'm a mentor to someone else. So from obviously we're talking about mentees and the support they get, but I'm finding a huge amount of satisfaction actually on the other side, actually mentoring people and all mm. these Everything that you've both been talking about today does play into that. So the fact that I'm much more highly engaged now at work, yes. the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, you're speaking to people and you're almost seeing your younger self in them in some way without doing the whole I told, I told you so thing. But yeah. I find it really rewarding. So does this research cover both sides or is there other research that's done Well, there's done quite separately? a lot of research around the, the impact on mentors. Yeah. One, one, <clears throat> one of the areas that I find most mm. particularly interesting is people who, managers who've plateaued. Yes. Um, and how do they and, and what what actually helps those those mm. people re, get a, re, a real rekindle their interest in their yeah. career and their activity in their career? And it turns out that having a mentee mm. is, is is really powerful. Definitely. Um, uh, because what happens is you, you start thinking about, well, you know, I'm helping this person think through what mm. they're doing, but I could be taking some of those lessons, yeah. too. <clears throat> so we find that mentors who sort of who let their, let their career sort of slide a little bit, they get engaged with the mentee and they think, well, I could, I could do some more of that, and they get back mm. into their own career management and then they, they get promoted. Yep. Um, and, and this is a phenomenon we see time and time mm. and again inside organisations. So it, it's really good for the mentor to have somebody to G them up a little yeah. bit. Yeah, sort of reinvigorating, if you like. Um, now, before we go on to the next section, which is mm. virtual mentoring, which is always very exciting, we've got a few questions and I just want to stay on topic here. So first one um, is from Jennifer. So this is in relation to ethical mentoring, but I think it can also be spoken to about the wellness program side of things. Mm. Is ethical mentoring performed in isolation from regular mentoring? Um, they can be combined. Yep. Um, because obviously some t you, you may have a, an ethical mm -hmm. issue come up within, within um, a, a mentoring relationship. Um, but to do the job properly, you need some, some special training in, in, okay. in, in, in ethical mm -hmm. psychology. Yeah. Um, it's not a long training. It's, a, it's typically a day. Yep. Um, but you need some extra tools and, and, and techniques for it. Mm. Okay, great. Um, another one um, Joanne, from Joanne, um, and this I think I'll ask you, Melissa. What are some good resources to assist a small not-for-profit to establish a mentoring program? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that one was going to come up. Look, there's so much free stuff on the internet. It's, it's a question of how you find it. Um, you know, a good place to start is our website. We've yep. got a lot of free materials. David, I think you've yep. got a lot yep. of free materials yep. on your website, nice. so I'd suggest go look there. Um, we always offer, you know, preferential rates for not-for-profits, mm -hmm. so we try and help where we can. Okay. Um, yeah. I guess, like we said, you know, it's just exploding now and there's so much stuff on it. Yeah, I think um, the difficulty is sorting the good stuff from yeah. the not-so-good stuff. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I, th I think <clears throat> a word of, word of warning there, though, is just to say, right, well, look, we'll, we've, we're not going to, we haven't got any resources to do mm, this, so yeah. we're just going to do a mentoring scheme. We're just going to, um, it's a disaster mm. in most cases. And, it, and, and 
what tends to happen is because it fails, you've now created a, a, a sense when you try and reintroduce the topic mm. um, from other people. Oh, yeah, remember, we tried that. It didn't work. Yeah. So you have to be so careful not to fall into that You want to get trap. it right the first time, don't yeah. you? So it, at least invest a lot of time um, and try and get, get a budget that enables you to train people. Mm. Tra and if you download the international standards, uh, yes. uh, yeah. that's a really, that gives you a sense of what you need to do. Um, and so, so that gives you uh, an idea of what's the minimum budget you can work yeah. on um, if you're going to, to try and meet those standards. Mm. Excellent. Good advice. Now, obviously, our mentoring programs shouldn't be bound by location, I think, mm -hmm. personally. Um, and I'm really interested in hearing more about this. So on to our third area, which is where we talk about virtual mentoring programs. So um, depending on a lot of organisations, um, they may be based in different locations. Um, what are your thoughts on virtual mentoring programs? Can they be effective? How is technology in enabling this? And I'm mm. guessing you might have a lot to yeah. say about yep. this one, David. I mean, basically, virtual, virtual mentoring is, is now taking over as, as, as the dominant form yep. of mentoring, particularly among the multinational organisations. Um, simply because if you're going to find the right mentor for somebody, um, they may well be in a different part of the country or a different mm. country entirely. Yep. And the technology makes it relatively simple, um, using things like Skype, for example, yep. or, or, um, or other, other vehicles like that. You can, you can do such a lot. Mm. Um, it, it reduces the power distance, so it's much easier to relax with people if, 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 if you're using the technology. Mm. Um, right, if you're in the room with them, sometimes that, that, that sense of, you know, um, I'm very authoritarian, mm. I'm authority, I'm, I, you just to listen to me, that sort of disappears. You don't yep. pontificate so much. Um, so, and, and then the other vehicles, of course, are, are simply by using email. Mm. If you have asynchronous email, uh, emails, and so you send an email and then there is a pause for some, for, yeah. uh, and the other person then replies. What, what you actually build in is some really valuable thinking time. Mm. And that actually enhances the quality of the mentoring conversation. Yep. Yeah, I think, um, look, we run a lot of programs that are all virtual, so nobody ever meets. The mentor and the mentee don't meet. The program managers don't meet any of the participants. Everything's done by webinar. Um, and it's surprisingly very, very effective. Mm. So I think for all the reasons David said, it's a bit counterintuitive that some of these methods of connecting with people mm. are actually um, able to work. But, you know, if people don't have an opportunity to meet face-to-face -face and they have no alternative, they find a way to mm. make it work. So we find we have probably, in the programs we run, maybe 20% <coughs> of people will be resistant to the idea mm -hmm. and may never, ever embrace the notion of... Um, of working with someone not in a face-to-face -face yes. relationship. Uh, but if, they, if we can overcome that resistance for them and with them, they discover, that actually, this works quite well. Mm. What a surprise. And, and I know because I, I'm coaching and working with people right through Asia and doing it all on FaceTime mm. and, uh, you know, people that I've never met. Mm. And it, it can be very, very effective. So... There's that side of it. Then there's all the technologies, which I think we maybe talked about mm. last time, um, all the technologies, the software that's around for actually just being able to track and manage yeah. um, mentoring programs because it can be very time intensive and it just takes a lot of, you know, the stress away from a program mm. manager. So I think it's exciting what mm. technology is enabling and I'm glad to hear you say that's becoming, it will move <coughs> towards being the dominant yeah. I, I think we're well on, we're well on the, on the way towards that. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, a lot a lot of organisations are doing their training, yeah, yeah. virtually as well. Um, <clears throat> in fact, um, one of the first I ever did was with the, uh, was that was quite a few years ago now mm. was the Australian Psychological Society. Oh, there um, you go. So they, they wanted some training for yeah. their mentors acro across Australia. There was no way that we, they would get everybody together. Mm. So we did it from England. Um, to to um, on a regular series of webinars, mm. um, and it worked exceedingly well. And I think so. So, so, we, we move, so much of it is moving to in line with the, what the technology is making possible. Mm, yeah, uh, and I think there <coughs> is working for Redback. I definitely understand the reluctance to technology a lot of the time. Um, mm. However, I think the easier technology gets, and I think the more people are exposed to it. Yeah. And you know, whether it's something as simple as using FaceTime or something mm. like this, 
you know, to have that sort of interaction with people. And one of the things um, I found that works really well is a blended mentor program. Exactly. So I um, have someone based in Melbourne who I do mentor, but every now and then when I do get to catch up, maybe mm. once every few months, there's that excitement. It's like, oh, we get to meet face to face. Let's have yeah. breakfast or let's have a coffee. There's that element to it. So it is a little bit the best of both worlds, I guess. And that's one of the recommendations <coughs> we make to our clients and to participants and we say mix it up. You know, yep. It doesn't have to be all email or, or Skype or FaceTime. You know, sometimes have a phone call, sometimes a short phone call, sometimes yep. you can meet face-to-face. -face. It just keeps it more mm. interesting as I well. I think so, yeah. yeah. There's a couple of things that, that we've been doing which, which was great, great fun. What, one is, is created a, a program which basically is, is it, it's, it's instructions. It actually takes somebody through virtual mentoring um, and, t and, and, you know, have you done this? And so it takes, takes them to the setting up the relationship, having the conversations. Wow. So you've got a sitting by Nelly, if you like, yeah. um, all the way through. And, and, and that, that's called Mentor Master. And that's a, that's a, a very simple way of, of doing it. It's, it's, it's a little clunky, yeah. with, of, of, as these things always are. But it's, but it's a way of, of doing it. And the other thing that I find really fascinating is uh, this thing called Pro Real, which is a virtual world. Wow. Um, where the mentor mentee can, can meet in this virtual world through avatars. Oh, so you can dress up and create your own person. Yeah, Perfect. Well, uh, unfortunately, you can't dress up in them, but, but you, 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 because the, the, the avatars are all quite standard sort of shape. Yeah. But you can make them bigger size, colours, all sorts of things. And you can then create further avatars which relate things about the situation you're describing. So if you've got some real um, um, fears, for example, mm. um, they can be a minefield behind you or they, or your inner voice can become a great big giant that's standing over wow. you, shouting at you. Um, so all sorts of things you can do with, with, to be creative in this yeah. virtual world. Mm. That's where everything's going, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, now before we go into the last part, um, just one little thing from um, Lisa, and she wants to know if she could have a link to the International Standards Resource. Um, mm. Now, we will be sending out um, a link to the recording. Yeah, we'll so um, can we include that in there as well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, Excellent. No okay, now off virtual mentoring now and turning to the last topic of the webcast, sustainability, mm. which I think everyone wants to know a little bit more about. What are some of the keys to making a mentoring program have staying power and that long-lasting impact? Because obviously Obviously, it's something that we're not just want to, you know, do for a one-off. Mm. Mm. And then as people go throughout the organisation, we obviously want to build this as a big program that we can continue on. So let's talk sustainability. Mm. Um, we've got a few points on the slide here. I think the, the most important, really probably the most important thing is having some champions that support the program. Mm. And that, that kind of links back to having a good reason to have the program in the first place. If it yep. becomes a nice-to-have mentoring program, then it, it really won't last. Mm. Setting expectations for everyone participating and training the, the people that participate. David, you've got some research around um, what happens if you don't train people yeah, for the but, stats. But ba basically, if you don't train anybody, uh, your maximum you get is three relationships out of ten delivering significant value. If you wow. train the mentors, you double that. If you train the mentors and the mentees and brief their line managers, if, you know, if they have them, um, then you push it up to 95%. That's a lot for a little bit of investment in terms exactly. of time, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so these, these are the sorts of things that if you don't get that right, you know, this is why programs fall over. Mm. Not highlighting and celebrating the checkpoints, acknowledging, you know, we're halfway through a six- or a 12-month program and bringing people back together to talk to one another and get ideas keeping on providing support and encouraging commitment um, and really under-investing. I think the point we're coming to now is if you, if you can't support and do mentoring well, then you're actually better off not to start because yeah. it can be very brand damaging, mm. actually, if you don't do it well, as we're discovering from In Her Sight's website about yeah. all those companies yeah. that have poorly ranked well, one of the things we, 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 we found uh, a while ago that um, one of the reasons that, that people, the young graduates, didn't join Mm -hmm. some of the professional services firms, was because they, it was perceived that their, their, their mentoring program for when the, the, that they would go to when they joined wasn't good enough. No. Oh. Um, so yeah. that, that, I think, you know, that's... Pretty that's, good feedback. <laughs> uh, it's pretty good feedback, yeah. You know, because because the, the, particularly the generations coming mm -hmm. into the workforce now expect it. Yes. Uh, and, if, and, and so they, they've got an idea of what the standard should be. Mm -hmm. And if it isn't good enough, and they, then they'll talk to other pe people in the firm 
or to their friends and so forth. If it isn't good enough, then you're, you're actually losing some of that talent. Mm. Um, so I think that, that's, quite, that's quite a challenge. There's a few other things, too, that we found that are, quite, that, that, that are helpful. One is that actually measure, measurement as you go along, mm -hmm. there's a direct correlation between the, 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 the measurement that you do and the sustainability of the relationships. Okay. So if you measure people, people and ask them about how the relationship is going, people then try and, and, and encourage them to have a conversation about it. That actually they, they think about it and therefore they talk. They, they, they actually improve the quality and depth of the conversations they have. Mm -hmm. um, so um, managing endings is, a, is an important thing too. Mm -hmm. If you if you just let the relationships drift away mm -hmm. at the end of the program. Um, there is a very high level of dissatisfaction amongst mentors and mentees um, subsequently mm -hmm. because they're not really sure. Did I add any value? What was, 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 was it appreciated? Yeah. Um, did I do something wrong? If you actually celebrate the, the endings of all the relationships and make sure that they review it, can say, say thank you to each other, uh, and basically you make it, you make it a, a, a very positive process mm -hmm. for the ending, then you, you, you find that, that the vast majority of mentors and mentees look back at it and say, that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Now, those are people who are going to be talking to other people who may be coming into the programme. It's all so, word of mouth at the end of the day, exactly. isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> so the sustainability is about how, what, what are the people saying when they've been through the mentoring mm -hmm. process. So that's, uh, making that ending really work, I think, is, 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 is important. We've also found some interesting stuff around accrediting mentors or, 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 or support supporting mentors through supervision. The more that mentors feel they're super, that they have this, 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 this support uh, to develop their skills, um, that there's a sort of professionalisation of themselves mm. in this, the more, the more committed they are to the programme and the more likely they are to, to recommend it to other people as well. Excellent. Some great stats there. Um, before we move on, um, we've got some questions that have come through, but I would just like to encourage everyone to complete the survey, which is located in the tab next to the PowerPoint slides. Um, obviously, it'll be great to get some feedback. Nice segue mm -hmm. there. See that? Yeah. <laughs> um, and what we've spoken about today, but also put your details in if you do want to receive some additional information from Art of Mentoring um, and any sure. additional resources we've spoken about today. We can also include those, mm -hmm. I'm assuming. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, I just want to touch on a few questions because I do realise we are getting close to time. First of all, one that's just standing out to me. Who's responsible for this in an organisation? Because uh, I think depending on the size of an organisation and depending on the, oh, no, he said, she said, is there, do we see in the future a mentoring manager as part of an organisation? Is that what you both want to aim for or think that's, you know, the, the ideal scenario? Or are there other people who can take on these roles to manage these programs in the meantime? It's interesting. Yes, there are mentoring managers. So okay. in associations in particular, you, you tend to have full-time or part-time people who look after the programs because many of them are big. You know, we've yeah. got hundreds of pairs. In corporates, it's often the HR people, learning yeah. and development. But increasingly, and David, we were talking about this before, um, organisations are saying, we don't have anybody internal to do this. We need to actually outsource the whole thing mm. and have somebody manage it. You still need the internal champion yes. to make sure you're getting the right people in and to keep the rah-rah factor up. Yeah. But actually you can have somebody else come in and, and manage the program. You're seeing that trend in Yeah, and, and we, well. we, we run periodically um, programs to train mentoring program managers. Yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, that and that's just gives them equips them with all the knowledge that they that they need to be able to do a really good job of it, um, and it enables them to, to to network with other people who mm. are running programs. That I think is a that really important thing. That if you you know if you are a mentoring program manager, build your own network of other people who yeah. you you can benchmark against. Wow. Um, so is there a mentor in association? Oh, <laughs> what a good idea. <laughs> Four no, mentors. Maybe we should start one. There you go. <laughs> we've, got, um, we've got in Europe, we've got the European Mentoring and Coaching Council. Yeah. Uh, oh, OK. Which so started funny. life as the European Mentoring Centre. Oh. Um, but then we brought in the coaches because internal coaching and, inter and mentoring are pretty similar. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot, lot of uh, similarities between them. Um, and um, that, that, is, uh, that, that is basically obviously in Europe, mm. um, but it has associations with some, with some other countries. And mm. Mm. We're looking at maybe doing something here with the MCC. Yep. Nice. Yeah. Um, so just some uh, questions that have come through. So from Roz and something I need to write down as well, the name of the virtual space with avatars that you were talking it's about. It's called Pro Real. So that's P-R-O hyphen real. R-E-A-L. <laughs> Yep. Not real, yep. Okay, good. Um, there's some nice um, demos um, from uh, the guy uh, running it, David Tinker, on YouTube. 
Oh, okay. David Finker <coughs> on YouTube. Okay, um, so also from Derek, so just what we were talking about, about administering uh, programs, how can an association that administers a mentor program help manage the ending of the mentor or mentee, rela and mentee relationship? Well, what we do is we start sending people reminders um, mm. about a month before the program finishes. Okay. So asking them to have a, a meeting with <coughs> their um, partner and start talking about how the um, mentoring relationship will will transition into something mm. else, whether that's an informal arrangement or perhaps they'll choose to end. But um, doing, you know, having that meeting and, as David said, if you don't manage the ending well, it's, you know, it's really important to do that well. So it's really about being part of it from beginning to end. That's what I'm yeah. sensing here, isn't yeah. it? But mm. obviously having that goal in mind from the beginning so as an organisation you're still on top of everything that's happening. Yeah. We're, we're currently looking, looking into how can we actually have a sort of party for a cohort of mentors ah. at the, uh, online. Yeah. That how would be we, encouraging how, for a few people. <laughs> but, well, we're, we're actually trying to design virtual parties to say thank you. And, and certainly those programmes where they've, they've actually brought everybody together um, to celebrate. It, it's, it's very, very emotional yes. when people mm, talk totally. about their experience. Um, but it has a very big impact because you can, you can showcase, you can use the people from one program, from one cohort, to actually be, to, 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 to talk about their experience, which really encourages the next cohort. Mm. Exactly. Yeah, they become ambassadors. And you do hear some wonderful <laughs> Yeah. It's, all, it's my favourite meeting of the program. Yeah, I guess it would be. Um, also for Jennifer, yes, the information is available afterwards. We will be sending a copy of the recording of the webcast, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, and also from Louise, so can we access the data of the research you spoke about in terms of training outcomes? Um, what was the report that you actually did reference, which is going back to the beginning, mm -hmm. um, if you don't train your participants and the percentage of successful relationships, yeah. that data that we were that speaking was... about? It's, 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 <clears throat> that's data that's extrapolated from the uh, the international standards. Oh, uh, okay. Um, so, uh, but I don't know whether that's on the on the on the website or not. Okay. Yeah, and the research I talked about, there's an insight report which is on our website, so insight. people can download that. Excellent. Um, Okay, well, that brings us to the end. Actually, we've got one more site question, which I okay. think um, this might relate to the previous one. So what are some examples of mentoring metrics? So, i.e., what are some success measures? Mm. Uh, Do you want to address shall I, shall I, Yeah, it, it, there, are, there are program managers and there are relationship manage, yeah, yeah. Me, uh, measures. Um, so so the, the program managers would relate to what, what was the purpose mm. um, of, of it. So if the purpose was retention, you can measure retention. Yeah. Then so that's fairly fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. Relationship me relationship measures. There are four things that we've identified from 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 very long term research around this. One is what's happened for the individual in terms of their career. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is what's happened in terms of their learning. So, uh, what, 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 and the third one is what's happened in terms of what we call enabling outcomes. Those are things like having a better personal development plan, a clear idea of where you want to go, mm. you know, greater uh, and, and so forth. And the fourth one is emotional. Um, so what's happened in terms of building your self-efficacy and your self-confidence? Yep. Those are the four key things that we measure, and we measure them for mentors and mentees because yeah. they both get they some both of those. They both matter, definitely. Yeah. Melissa? Very good. Agreed? Yeah, I mean, focus, I guess, on did the mentee achieve um, the outcomes that they mm. were looking for? One of the things we've started doing is going back a year or two afterwards mm. to see what outcomes there are further down the track, yep. and that's starting to be quite interesting. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. All right, well, that does bring us to the end. I'd like to personally thank everyone for joining, um, as well as Melissa. Lovely to have you back thank again. You. Um, and also, David, thank you so great much. We hope yeah. you enjoy the rest of your time in Sydney. It's been great. Um, for those of you who would like more information, like I said, please complete the survey. There are details in there to put in your details. Otherwise, we will be sending out the recording along with any supporting materials. Right. Otherwise, um, that's all for us. Um, feel free to check out the Art of Mentoring website. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact us directly. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. The rest of your day. Bye.